Good morning and welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Tim Walton, I'm a senior fellow in Hudson's Center for Defense Concepts and Technology, and I'm really grateful that all of you have taken the time to join us for what I think should be a really timely and rich conversation on achieving electromagnetic spectrum superiority with the Congressional Electromagnetic Warfare Working Group. Um, to kick us off uh, and to introduce our distinguished guests, and open the floor to them is Brian Hinckley, who's president of the Association of Old Crows. Uh, Brian served for 27 years as a Naval Electronic Countermeasures Officer, um, conducting operations over Libya, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, leading one of the key joint counter improvised electronic or uh, improvised explosive device mm -hmm. units in Iraq and then standing up the Navy's first Fleet Electronic Warfare Center uh, before retiring as a captain. He now serves as president of the AOC, which is the world's preeminent professional uh, nonprofit organization focused on electronic warfare and tactical information operations. I think he flew the EA-6 for some reason. It, it, I'm not <laughs> sure oh, it's apparent, oh, but yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> I, that I did. Well, Thanks, thank Brian. you. Thank you, Tim. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. My remarks will be very short because we're here to listen to our esteemed panel. Um, we're very, very lucky to have uh, from Congress rep representatives uh, Houlihan uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Bacon from Nebraska, and Lawson from Washington. Uh, they have been tremendous uh, advocates uh, with over 20 years of uh, service on the Congressional uh, the EW Working Group, um, over, I think, five years, and appreciate you brand new and, and bringing in some, some new energy and an MIT degree to help us with uh, advancing, <laughs> advancing technology. So it's, it's very, very important. I appreciate your notes, or your words on the AOC. Um, we're very, very proud, and I'm proud to be here to represent uh, over 14,000 members, um, 70 chapters, and almost 30 countries. So we just came from AOC Europe. Um, we've had events all over the world, and we're looking forward to our big event uh, this December. It's every December here in the D.C. area um, for the next five years. We'll be at uh, the Gaylord. So I'm looking forward to that. But um, well, let's get started, um, and we'll get into some of the questions that have been uh, sent in. Um, so let me kind of go to the first one here, and we'll talk about last week's uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I, I know, I know, um, Congressman Bacon has has been very successful at, at getting some language in there and approved unanimously. Um, how, how do you view the EMSO capabilities for electromagnetic spectrum operations? How will they fare in the House's authorization bill? Um, are there particular areas where you've worked to apply either additional insight or investment? Want me to start? Okay. Please. First of all, it's great to be back. I'm Joined the Air Force in 1985, a long time electronic warfare uh, guy. I was RC 135s, EC 130s. Wearing my AOC tie today, just to. Yes. So Brian asked me easier questions. <laughs> and but a little backdrop, if I may. I we came in and when I came in 1985, I thought the electronic warfare capabilities of the United States was second to none. We were the preeminent EW uh, military in the world. We had the iron on the ramp with the uh, we call it the electronic. Warfare triad, <laughs> you know, with uh, we had the EA sixes, the Compass Call, Rivet Joint. Uh, you had uh, the F four Gs, and we had a great strategy. We had a great personnel development uh, system with uh, Electronic Warfare School. We had a two star in charge, at least in the Air Force. You had a lot more oversight in the Joint Staff. But after 1991, when we just totally kicked the living bejeebers out of Iraq we felt like we didn't need EW as much anymore. So we put it in autopilot, and over the time, it just sort of withered and atrophied. And even in the 90s, I felt like we still had the pre preeminent EW, but by the time I was a colonel, brigadier general, it was clear that we let things atrophy to a, a large degree, and Russia and China, in many areas, had, had surpassed us, because they were focused on it. So you know, one of the, the storylines in EW is if you feel like you're the dominant power, you don't need EW. You need EW if you feel like you're struggling. You, 
You have a hard time getting aircraft over a target and back, then you invest in EW. Russia and China were doing that, we were not. Uh, so then when I got elected in 2017 and working with Congressman Larson initially, uh, we've been able to put a lot of good things in legislation. We've been able to mandate that the, the DOD or joint staff put people in charge, that we can hold accountable, a new strategy, a new implementation plan, insist that each COCOM has electronic magnetic cell to, to, that can have a standardized way of looking at their electronic warfare capabilities in each COCOM, and we've done that. But in this, to, now to get to your, your question, I want to put that as a backdrop. We did not get much done in this particular NDAA uh, when it comes to electronic magnetic spectrum operations. Most of the work was done last year where we were able to procure four more compass color aircraft. You were doing stuff on the EF-18. Mm. EF uh, this time it was more because we have a more uh, restricted budget this year. It's under inflation. I, we didn't get as much done. And it concerns me because we had an opportunity to expand more <clears throat> compass call aircraft, Navy, maybe more Navy EW. And we, we saw very little in the actual budgeting that came out in the electronic warfare realm. And so I, I, we didn't get as much done as I would like this NDA. Last NDA, we got a lot done. Okay. Thank you. Anything to add to that one? We can move on, or? I'll just uh, quickly say, um, since I got unceremoniously kicked off the Armed Services Committee, if I could apply to be an associate member of the AOC. <laughs> no. um, <clears throat> as a member, as a, the ranking member on the Transportation Committee, uh, under our caucus rules, I couldn't serve on HASC. Uh, so um, I've uh, uh, had to step off of HASC. But in, I say in the 22 years on HASC, uh, one of the great pleasures has been working on, on this uh, set of issues, and, uh, and I'll continue to work on the set of issues. And if I could uh, um, <clears throat> maybe uh, offer a quick 22-year perspective, is that um, funding for EW or MSO is feast or famine. Um, it's feast when we, uh, when we need it, and we always need it too late because we were in a famine mode. Um, when we think we don't need it anymore. And the truth is, we're fun we know, we always need it. And um, you think about rivet joint or, uh, or, or the growlers uh, um, or uh, compass call, they're in use right now. Um, all those are in use right now. The growlers out of uh, Woodby Island were deployed last year into Germany uh, in support of the mission, uh, the, in support of the NATO mission uh, against Russia, um, not in Ukraine, but around Ukraine. Um, so, th as an example of uh, how we continue to use the airborne platforms, and that's where I got first involved in, uh, in this as well, certainly because of the airborne um, electronic attack platforms that um, previously the Prowler, now the Growler, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll continue, continue to do that. But I think, again, it's been feast or famine is one lesson. The second lesson is, kind of oh, Don alluded to, is you need leadership at the Pentagon, you need a training um, uh, aspect to make sure there's always people coming in the pipeline. You need to partner with uh, the research labs, any research labs, preferably the military research labs, and, uh, and, the, and the industry uh, to keep up on um, what spectrum is, how it's changing, how it's being used, how others are using it, and what you need to do to counter that. Th I mean, those are always a, the four key elements uh, and this, and I only know this because we wrote this report, I think, in 2003. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> um, the framework's always there. We just have to fill it, and the Pentagon needs to fill that framework too. Could I add one quick thing? Because I'm the new person on this panel. Is the last part of the puzzle? I think is education. Education, not just of people who know all the things and who've been doing it for a long time, and education of. Um, the HASC and uh, the Intel Committee and uh, any number of intersection um, maladies that exist for this, but also just education of the common member of Congress in terms of why it is that we were talking about these issues and why we care about them and why we need to fund them. Uh, having served a million years ago, I left in 1992 the military. Um, I feel like everything old is new again. You know, you come back in 30-something years later and it all similar, looks similar, or at least rhymes. Uh, and so I think that that's you know, another aspect of trying to make sure that we can educate the public and educate the people who are making the votes on why this kind of thing is important. Hey, Brian, if you could just put an exclamation point on something. If it wasn't for Congress, any progress we made in the last six or seven years, I don't think would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the military was not interested, generally, in putting someone in charge, new strategy, funding lines. It was us mandating it in the NDAA. 
And a lot of times, Home Military doesn't want congressional interference. <laughs> I think in this case, we, we did some good. I call it oversight. <laughs> <laughs> oversight. I like that. It's not an interference. <laughs> well, ma'am, you've, uh, you've obviously already been working um, through Congress with the DOD on improving how we can uh, not only uh, find the right young folks with the right technology to keep our community strong, but also to retain them. Um, so this question uh, follows a little bit more along that, not just the education, but the industrial base that we were talking about, partnering with labs, um, whether we're talking about OEMs or whether we're talking about some of the, the niche small businesses that can bring their capability to bear. Um, how do you view the MSO industrial base for building new capabilities and, and the degree to which it can leverage commercial capacity? Um, I know you were, uh, Congress recently passed the, I think it was $280 billion in the CHIPS Act. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know you're familiar with that. Um, so anything, I see uh, shoes in the audience, anything to talk about opportunities using 5G or to, or to shore up the supply chain, which I know you're personally mm -hmm. invested mm -hmm. in. Well, I think that uh, this is, kind of speaks to the conversation that I was trying to allude to, which is it, this is not just a DOD-centric conversation, although it is obviously about national security, but it's also about uh, sharing capabilities, technologies, understanding people across uh, DOD and industry, and making sure that we are uh, taking advantage of all of the capacity that we have, and that means uh, benefiting from commercial industry and also potentially 5G as well. And so I don't, I don't know how that's all going to shake out. I know that Don asked a lot of questions yesterday when we were at the Pentagon and other places about um, spectrum sharing and about you know, how we were going to work that out, if we were going to work that out, what the implications would be for that. Mm -hmm. um, but these conversations can't happen just in the Pentagon. You know, with, they need to happen across all of the different parts of, of industry and, and, as you mentioned, in terms of the commercial industry as well. I hope that CHIPS Act, as an example, will be a beginning um, of a longer process of trying to bring industry um, back here domestically and also you know, creating jobs and opportunities. And you started the question with uh, a workforce question, I thought. Mm -hmm. you know, Making sure that we also have the workforce that's capable of understanding these issues is really, really important, too. Right. We appreciate your efforts in that. Um, I think we have a question. I think the, this, the question of spectrum sharing, uh, 5G, S-band interference, uh, is I think one that, that was started to bubble up in maybe five years ago, but, but now is a, is a pretty hot topic. Um, as you work with your colleagues in sort of other committees and the like, how have those conversations been and what path do you see forward for, I think, DOD and, and other stakeholders to be able to best use the spectrum either through um, allocation, through new electromagnetic battle management capabilities that we could use domestically and abroad. What are some of your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, I can uh, provide some lessons from the transportation uh, world in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, first, I want to say that um, as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we put a, a report in that for the DOD to conduct a study um, on the 3.1 to 3.45 segment of the spectrum. I'm reading the numbers. I want to get the numbers right and, and not make news here. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, that was due in March. And uh, I just want to sit you down because it's breaking news. Uh, the, the Pentagon didn't meet that deadline for the report. <laughs> um, so uh, we're continuing to press the, the, the Pentagon. And, and the issue there is, uh, um, is you know, the, the, the industry believes, oh, spectrum sharing can occur, and it's all pretty easy the way to do it, depending on how you define it and so on. And the DOD's view is this is our spectrum we need when we need it and can't share it. Um, and is there a place in between? I'm not suggesting that there is absolutely a place in between, but I do know this, and this is the lesson. Um, from the 5G altimeter issue uh, that we had with the FAA, and I won't go into it, but uh, it's long and frustrating. <laughs> but what we did, what we found in this, in this thing, in this debate um, between the FAA and and the FCC and the NTIA and a lot of other alphabets um, and the telecom industry is that uh, there was a solution, a technical solution, but no one believed it actually ha could happen because they weren't even talking to each other in the first place. As an example, the telecom engineers and the uh, engineers who do FAA engineering stuff have one thing in common. They're engineers. 
That's the only thing they have in common. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that anything wrong with that. <laughs> that said, um, you know the term is all Greek to me, right? You can't read Greek or whatever, but uh, with apologies to my good friends in Greece. Um, uh, <laughs> telecom engineers use Greek letters, and aerospace engineers use Greek letters. They use the same Greek letters, and they mean different things for their uses in telecom and in, in aerospace. That is how basic the misunderstanding is. <laughs> Like the engineers can't even talk to each other because their languages are literally different. <coughs> and that's a lesson we learned, and it's been learned. We've created a process now because there's going to be 6G and XG and the next G. And at some point, um, this, this altimeter issue is going to continue to evolve with the technology. And I think that lesson can apply to the DoD spectrum sharing issue. It's one of the lessons. They, they first need to start sitting down and saying, OK, what? how do you use the the gamma letter. How do you how do you use delta? How do you use epsilon? <laughs> Let's start there and then go from there. But right now, you know, we're not. The, the discussion is saying it's ours. You can't use it. And telecom saying no, it's totally possible to share. And telecom may be absolutely wrong, and the DoD may be wrong. I have no idea. But they do need to have these conversations, and I think that's what we one totally thing we learned. Totally agree. What I heard yesterday in the Pentagon is similar to what I hear sometimes on this R's and D side of things: is that we only listen to each other, you know. And so, if we're listening to message points from one another on the D side, and ours are listening to their message points as well, not everybody can be an expert on everything, and so you're just trying to li listen and learn to what the presumable expert thinks. And so if you're sitting in the Pentagon and what you hear is a, a leader that you respect saying something like, well, we have to vacate the spectrum and it's impossible, then you just believe that that's true. And the same goes for the other mm -hmm. side. And so we yeah. have to be able to communicate. And I don't think that's happening. So this critical mission areas, <clears throat> our S-band, <clears throat> excuse me, our S-band's areas very, we're, we were talking to the four-star level yesterday, very important to a lot of our radar missions that are out there. And you don't want to degrade that. Yet 5G is very critical to our economy. So they're both very important. And, and I think if, if we could find a technical solution, that's obviously the optimal. Uh, but nobody believes it, like you were saying. Nobody thinks it's right. going to happen. Um, but we have to prove that it's going to work, because we need 5G, and we have to have important radar missions that the DoD operates. Um, but if we can't prove it, you can't just vacate the radar missions are already out there. So they're going to have to prove that this 5G can operate in, in that space. Yeah. One, I, one of the challenges we had in this debate was the proprietary nature of almost nearly everything telecoms do. And there's nothing against them. It's just that finding out that where a tower sits and uh, as well as which angle the radio is sitting, that's proprietary. And so they didn't want to give up that information to the FAA because they're concerned they were going to share that with one of the competitors in order to, in order to create the space where the altimeters could work. And well, they figured out a way to you know, have a third party in between to do that. And I think they're going to run into the same kinds of problems. right? The DOD says, we can't share x. Like, well, we don't need x. We need x minus something. And telecom is going to say, well, we can't tell you to share x, or we can't share y. I said, well, we don't need y. We need y minus something to, to figure this out. But they need to have those conversations. That was really helpful, and I'll sort of offer, if this is a challenge domestically, it could certainly be one abroad, right? So, so here in the United States, in theory, perhaps we could govern how we use the spectrum. It doesn't necessarily mean we will do it anywhere else US military forces will operate, either friendly countries or, or adversary ones. So it's, we probably need to think of approaches that work here domestically, but also take advantage of electromagnetic battle management capabilities or others so that we can dynamically operate in areas where there will be interference. The That's spectrum will be congested no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, I think you had another question there. I certainly do. Let's see. I, I know we've talked <clears throat> a little bit about readiness. We've talked about the non-material readiness and the training and the workforce. Uh, it's been a struggle. Um, we obviously were, were more successful in last year's uh, NDAA than maybe this year's. Um, you know, uh, cyber, for instance, the cyber force has done seemingly extremely well. Um, but um, electromagnetic warfare um, has seemed to have not done so well. I, we talked about the funding of it. Uh, it seems to be the, the last to fund in peacetime and the first to scream for uh, in a crisis. And that, that hasn't changed over the last 20, 30 years. 
Um, because we've talked about those, let, let's go to a specific example. Stratcom um, stood up the, the GEMSOC, the Joint EMS Operations Center, that's supposed to raise and aggregate force readiness across DOD. Um, do you think that this organization has the potential to do, to do what it needs to do for MSO governance and development? Because I, I'll be quite honest, um, I haven't seen it really produce yet. It just stood up. Yeah, In fact, it's going to be, be, it's gonna be next week. I didn't know that it had. So next, <laughs> yeah, I think it's so, next week or the following yeah. week it's going to actually have its ribbon cutting. Yeah. So I just taped some remarks for it. So it hasn't been really stood up yet. I, I think we need a, a center of excellence that advocates for electronic warfare or MSO. We don't really have that in the military. We need somebody that says, and it's going to be at the two-star level, two-star two Air Force uh, officer is going to uh, command this. So I look forward to having someone advocating and being the lead on, on this whole issue, which we don't have. I personally think electronic warfare or MSO uh, should be under the J3 or the J5. It should be under operational. It should be treated that way, just like any of the other. Putting bombs on target, we're gonna put trans on target. Once you, once you move it out of that area, it, it gets put in, and uh, it's not in the main focus of operations. And EW should be the, one of the focus areas of, of operations. But the JC is a product of the work that we've done in the NDA, frankly. We have forced putting people in, in the lead that we can hold accountable. Now, when I, when I first got elected, you walk into any service, you go, who's responsible for EW? And they go, our vice, our vice service chief is. Oh, he's got like 3,000 things he's got to do, right? Well, I want to see a one-star or two-star that we can call a committee and, you know, hold accountable, right? Not, I didn't mean the fist thing, literally, but, <laughs> but we want to hold people accountable. And, and if nobody's in charge, if everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge. Right. And if nobody's in charge, nobody's in charge. I mean, and that's what was going on. So I think we've really made some good pro pro progress here. But my concern is even last year's NDA, we would have not had the great results if it wasn't for Congress. It wasn't the mm -hmm. DOD coming in saying, here's our plan for an EW. No, it was we coming in saying, okay, we're going to add four aircraft here. We're going to protect this fleet. We're going to do this and that. And uh, so I feel, once again, that Congress is dominant. But my co main concern is it's well and good to have JE the, the JEC strategy and doctrine until you actually start seeing, I'll just call it iron, capability. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the ability to put military capabilities out in the field, then it's all talk. And so I've seen <clears throat> a lot of talk, a lot of thinking going on behind, the, behind closed doors. I don't see the output, the actual combat capability output that we need in EW. And so we're, uh, we're not there yet. We're moving, well, do I see a lot of planning, not a lot of output. Do you think the events of Ukraine and the, you know, kind of last year and so that's happening in Ukraine has made a difference in people's hearts and minds in the military as opposed to Congress? I hate to be the one yeah. answering the question, but I'm, I'm curious, no, you know. Yeah. Um, well, uh, EW is obviously having an impact or lack sure. thereof. Yeah. So on the downside in Ukraine, think about day one or day two of the war. Ukrainians were shooting down loaded airlift aircraft with paratroopers because they weren't, they, they did not degrade uh, the Ukrainian air defenses. I mean, imagine an airlift aircraft full of your elite paratroopers on board getting shot down. And that was, that, that was going on. We we're decimating a lot. The Ukrainian, Ukrainians did a good job really decimating a lot of the uh, Russian Air Force in their airspace. Conversely, the Russians have been able to be pretty effective too uh, in their airspace. On the other flip side of that, the ability of doing ELINT, detecting where the enemy is operating, and then able to put a, mm -hmm. a very accurate munition on top of that. Both sides have been very good at that, too. And so that's another form of electronic warfare. So obviously, we're seeing the benefits of having EW or the cost of not having it both ways in this. And I think that should be an impetus for us. And I think there is, but we're just too slow. It shouldn't take us five years, six years to turn a ship around. And I think. I don't think other countries take that long. We're, we're too bureaucratic, too slow at the top, and we're not seeing the product coming out on the backside. Can I say it a, a, a different way? And it, it's um, perhaps not having served in the military, I get an opportunity to really boil things down to how I get to see them without talking in Pentagonese. Um, and <laughs> if 
if a member of Congress can't kick it and break their toe on it, they don't want to fund it. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I always tell people, if, we, if members of Congress were in charge of making, uh, creating aircraft carriers, it would be 435 aircraft carriers, mm -hmm. right? One for each of our districts. And, um, and that's part of the problem we face in electronic warfare. It's electrons, you can't kick it. Uh, it doesn't show up on TV and blow up. Um, it doesn't, you know, none of this happens. But, you mentioned Ukraine, we know how it's being used, and it's being used very well and very effectively in many ways. Um, <clears throat> we're also, we know, if we're falling behind maybe some others. And if it's that important, then we should be funding it. It's just hard to get people to say, well, what's an electron look like? It's like I, I forgot a long time ago what an electron looks like. I know they're really important, um, and we need to fund them. I know they're really tiny, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really And they're not made of steel and I can't break my toe on it. But we need to, we need to be advocates and uh, promoters and evangelists for, for, it, um, for this as well. To break through the net, you know, I, I love the frigate class because the, they're all going to be in my district. I love it. <laughs> and I had nothing to do with that decision as well. So good for me. Um, but, uh, w but we need to have an, the EW capability, the training, the leadership, the education, uh, and the pipeline. Because um, that they're because they're usually first. Representative Bacon, I really appreciate your comment on the focus on operations, right? Trying to closely link operations to, to the electric <clears throat> spectrum activities, just because it is such a dynamic area. Um, and as DoD starts to talk more about mission integration, we're enabling military forces to operate together and create new effects chains or kill chains. It um, seems electromagnetic spectrum capabilities are going to be at the heart of that, yet one of the challenges we've observed is that there really aren't strong modeling and simulation capabilities, either in the joint staff uh, or in STRATCOM. So ho hopefully this new organization can help make that possible. Um, a question I had for, for the three of you was um, hearkening back to the, the balloon crisis we faced, um, where, where Chinese uh, stratospheric balloons penetrated to U.S. airspace. And I think it underscored the fact that there are balloons, there are satellites, there are probably in-place assets here in the United States that can collect on military operations and, and can observe our training exercises and the like. Um, as Congress starts to look, think about range modernization in different ways, are there new opportunities to think about virtual and constructive training that can probably home, uh, hone home station training, you know, make units better when they practice where they are at home, but also make it so that it's more difficult for adversaries to, to collect when they do these mm -hmm. large combined exercises? With electronic warfare, you have to have a lot of simulations because a lot of things we do are top secret. Mm -hmm. So you go to Nellis or you go to wherever out at you know, Utah, mm -hmm. and you start doing your special jamming modes, or well, that, those are easily collected upon. So I know flying a compass call aircraft for a long time and also flying in the RC-135s, you need to fly a little bit because you got to get that air sense. Uh, but a lot of things we do in the air, you're not, you can't, you're, you're not, you're simul you're not you are you are you are not actually doing it. In a simulator, you can use all your modes, and then you can show what kind of degradation it's having on this radar or on this data signal, which you can't do in real life. So you got to have a very good simulation capability if you want to be good at electronic warfare. And and try and then you got to and how do you make all the various assets work together, whether it's air or ground? You really can only do that also simula simulation because the minute you do that real world, oh, the, you know, they got satellites sucking all that in, probably got ground sources as well as far as we know. Um, so you, you, you got to have it. I thought it was interesting on the balloon, uh, the, the NORTHCOM commander came in and said they just didn't have the radars programmed for balloons. They, were, they programmed for, you know, the Doppler essentially for things going three or 400, 500 miles an hour. But balloons don't do that. So <laughs> they had to change their filters to do that. And then we learned also from that that they had a very, uh, the, I guess the ability to share all that data over a common network was also very poor. So uh, we walked away from the NORTHCOM commander briefing that there is a lot of work that needs to be done on the C2 and, and the ability to, for everybody to have the same picture of what's going on. But to answer your question, we need a very good simulation capability. Actually, we put some of that in legislation too. And I think the JEC will be a good advocate advocate for this. And the fact that we're putting electronic warfare cells, that's not really the appropriate name for it, and all our co cops mm -hmm. is going to help. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the structures being put in place that I think will make a difference there. 
Um, another question I wanted to ask the, the three of you uh, has to do with cooperation with allies and partners. Um, the national defense strategy um, talks about how critical allies and partners are to U.S. national security interests. We invariably will operate with allies and partners, yet our ability to integrate our operations or even collaborate sometimes in the electromagnetic spectrum um, is limited. So as you have sort of engagements with some of your counterparts and go on congressional delegation visits, is this topic of EMS operations starting to bubble up? Or, and is that something that you've considered raising in, in some of your NDAA work? It gets a, it's a, a little tough but I, um, because uh, if you thought the knowledge of members of Congress is weak on electronic warfare, um, uh, go to countries with militaries that don't have the capability at all. And so I, I go to NATO Parliamentary Assembly three times a year. We're meeting with our NATO partners, maintaining um, relationships, maintaining the budgets in these countries, trying to get them to up their budgets in these countries. For those who need it up as well, um, but one thing over the, over the last is pre, it was pre-Ukraine, but certainly over the last several years, NATO has been done a, a better job of developing mechanisms where uh, countries of NATO can cooperate outside of doing military activity like 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 Ukraine. Um, and one such effort is the Defense Innovation Accelerator for North America. It's short hands Diana conveniently. Um, and uh, it is—it's basically—it's—it's it's basically a mashup. Think of a mashup of DARPA, of um, of uh, private sector, and uh, and intelligence. So it's basically they're trying to create a a, a, a a 31 country, soon to be 32 country, uh, officially effort uh, to invest in emerging technologies and collect the money. You know, do a collect the money from other, all these countries to invest in emerging technologies that can be used for NATO-specific uh, needs. And so there's a whole process to define what those needs are. Barbara McQuiston out of uh, R&E and the Pentagon is the chair of the board of Diana. We're able to make that happen. There's two Americans on the board, so we're going to have some influence. We're, we're, we've, we're gonna, we authorize, uh, in, in the NDA, um, we put an authorization so the DOD could spend money on it. It's a lousy $47 million over five years compared to the $1.1 billion that the European uh, friends are going to be putting, Canadian friends are going to be putting in. So it's a very small investment for hopefully a big payoff. But that's sort of a process, and we're on the early stages of that. But I think, um, again, our, our prowess in EW uh, really makes it difficult to fully cooperate because uh, it really is a matter of educating, still educating folks on what it is and how it can be used. Okay, can I give one success story? No, no, no happiness. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, we're here to uh, I'm the, create I'm a, problems. I'm a quarter so. glass full guy. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta think about that one for a second. Um, so I, you know, I had four assignments in the 55th wing, and so I, <clears throat> EC-130s, RC-135s are you know, my background big time. The British bought, bought three RC-135s. And we had 17 in the Air Force, they bought three, so that's a fleet of 20. And I was sort of the, I had to oversee the training. So we brought in the British into Offutt. We're, we're training guys that had 4,000 hours in the Nimrod. They were teaching us a lot of things. The British had, they pretty much invented electronic warfare, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so that, having a, that synergy between us, they were learning how to fly the RC, but they were teaching us a lot mm -hmm. on the science of EW. They, they go to one weapon system frequently. That's where they stay for 30 years. We do our three-year assignments. So just this different culture. Uh, but we really benefit from this mutual training. But my vision, and I worked with Pat Flood on this, uh, who's on our team now, our, our vision was, let's not treat this 17 and 3. I did not want to have a mm -hmm. US RC, I'll just hypothetically flying out of value deed, focused on Iran. And then the British think they have to have that there too, theirs. When, they, when we could maybe treat like a fleet of 20, and we mm -hmm. can put, OK, we need to have a need there. The British go over here. We got a need over here. The American will go over here. But that, that means you have to have a common database. Everything goes in the database. I will tell you, I, I, did, I failed while I was active duty, but it became a reality after I left. I couldn't get a fleet of 20. The joint staff insisted on 17 and 3, because we've never done it any way different. <laughs> Thankfully, after I left, I, maybe they just needed a better advocate. They saw the light. That's, now they treat it like a fleet of 20. And I tell you, that's, that's a win-win for Britain and America. But the way to do that, then everything has to go into a common database that we sh because 
if we won't share what we just learned over X, well, then the British can have the plane there. So we got to be able to share that data so that we can integrate our 20. We got that done. But then we had no form. So we've been mm -hmm. able to get, so we had to beat that down so that the British could have full access. No. And then to really do that, you had to be able to put British on US airplanes, Americans on British airplanes. We're doing that now. Uh, it's really the, I think it's the benchmark of how allies can work together in the EW area. But it did come easy. But if I, if I, I didn't could, get there. I didn't get there during my active duty time. <laughs> yeah, and if I could kind of go back to the original part of the question, which is allies, and I know that you mentioned, you know, Europe and NATO, and um, before this Congress, I was on arms uh, foreign affairs and was told I had to get off of foreign affirms to be able to be on Intel, our our and the Democrats, um, and you know, had focused on Asia in particular. So a lot of my travel is in in Asia. Um, and I would say, similar to what Rick, you're observing, is it's it's hard to have these conversations when the you know understanding is is very nascent right now, and the and the priorities are are in other areas, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that needs to be brought up, um, and something that needs to be uh, part of the the conversation, just as we're talking about AI or we're talking about any number of kinds of more sexy things that people understand or at least conceive of a little bit better. So. Um, I think that we are, you know, leaders in this area, and we need to make sure that we're leading with that. It's given me something to think about when I go on my trips that I'll make sure that I'll be talking about in the same way that I'm talking about all the other kinds of um, security issues that we're having with our allies. I suggest, why can't we take the, the U.S. British model, though? I'll see how we can expand that. Yeah. I think Australia would be a common sense. Yeah. Next so up, so and then maybe Japan. I'm just saying, there's Japan a way that we can. So Young at this right now, it, at everything right It now. is, but without Japan fully in 100%. with us, I don't see how we counter China 100%. too well. So there, there are yeah. there are examples. That you mentioned Australians and with the P eights. We sell the P eights there and, and other kind of other countries as well. Norway, but if I'm not mistaken, the growler, Australia has trained some growler pilots as well, and they have a growler yes, have. squadron. A couple, I think, two growler squadrons um, as well. But th th that's great. But it's still it's a platform by platform thing. Mm -hmm. Right. This is like still walking and there's no running at all and there's I no there's no big idea there's no big plan kind of um and as opposed to just platform by platform that's not going to cut it right that's good we have to use that as a something if we have reporters out there look at that british us thing though it's a good story <laughs> well we're, we're certainly respectful of your time and i know we're going to lose congressman larson here in about six minutes so um that's a really hard question we're going to open it up to the floor Please, so I'd just ask if you could please uh, identify yourself and then uh, ask a question as part of that. And, uh, Morgan will uh, bring the mic to the first question here in the front, please. Hi, uh, Mark Pomerlo with Defense Scoop. Uh, Congressman Bacon, going back to what you were talking about, about capability, what can Congress do to help accelerate that, right? The Army's been talking about getting a, a jammer out for the last 10 years and outside of QRC capability, this year, I think, is the first year they'll get it. You know, Next Gen Jammer is another example. You know, what can Congress do to maybe accelerate capability, delivery, um, and development yeah, in kind of the wow. software-centric area? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to keep pushing until yeah. they start leading in yeah. this area. That's what, unfortunately, that's how I perceive it. An example, one of the services, I'm trying to be nice, gave uh, us a brief saying, this is the capability we need to counter our threats in Asia. I go, how much are you budgeting for? And it was zero. And you're like, uh, there's a disconnect there. Until, until they could come in and say, this is our need, and here's our plan to get there, and here's how we're spending the money, it's just all talk. And so I've, I feel compelled that we have to keep pushing them until they say they're, until they're leading on, on us, and I just haven't seen it yet. And I get it, too. There's a finite budget. You know, we're trying to do F-35s and the Air Force side, B-21s, ICBMs, and you know, everybody's got all these needs. That it makes it hard to fit all of it into one budget, and I understand that. Um, but what they're really saying is, okay, we need this capability, but we're, we're not going to spend it. They're pretty much asking us to find a way to do it for them. Um, that's my take. <laughs> I, that's not a very fulfilling answer. Uh, if I could try to <clears throat> maybe add some context to it. So after, um, <clears throat> after the end of the Cold War, Air Force got out of EW, and really the Navy was the only... Uh, airborne platform, at least um, with the, with the uh, with the Prowler, eventually the Growler, and then when Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iraq came along, um, obviously the, with the um, 
IEDs and roadside bombs, and roadside bombs really um, brought up this issue of how to counter those. And you counter those with, you know, by jamming them, um, in part. And so the Navy was had all sorts of these folks on uh, IA, uh, individual augmentee. They'd show up in Iraq or Afghanistan, the Army would say, what, what are you guys doing here? Um, and they said, we're here to help. And like, how can the Navy help? Because there was just a zero sort of base knowledge about jamming. And um, I know Pete Corelli uh, uh, stood up a cadre, about 1,200 or so folks, to try to train up for, 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 for uh, jamming as part of Jayeto and so on. Um, it, but it, it just, it, I only bring this up because it just seems like, and I love the Navy because they're in my district. Okay, I'm a little biased on this one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but it just seems the other services, since they haven't been in the business for a while, are, are still even, still even trying to find their place in EW. And that's, and that's why Stratcoms and this effort is so important. It's what we've been screaming for for 20 plus years. It's like, the Pentagon needs to put an umbrella on this and provide some direction and provide the, the path to resources. And the Army jamming is going to, going to be different than what the Navy's doing. And the Marine Corps is going to be different than what the Army's doing. And the Air Force is going to be different. Um, but it's just, but there, there is a common issue here, and that's electronic warfare and the, uh, its ability to set an environment. Um, it just depends what environment are you trying to set and who's the best um, person in that in the services to do, do that. Uh, and it's just it's just been a you know a twenty three year frustration. And before me, I didn't start the I didn't start the EW working group. I um, it existed six to ten years before I got there. Joe Pitts was yeah, from, from Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. I go visit while I was a colonel. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I you know you asked that question and just just like you know. When you were Porter at four years old, did you did you ask me that question then too? Because it's the same question, um, <laughs> <laughs> with the I, same answer. Yeah. He triggered a thought. <laughs> there are success stories out there, though. Compass Call was designed to jam communications, some specialized radars, and other things. During the IED fight, yeah, they right. they put some special jammers on board to trigger IEDs, and I saw it commanded two squadrons of Compass Calls, a group and a wing, of it over my career. Uh, in the mid-2000s, when Gerald Mattis was a two-star, he was out in Anbar province, yeah. and he had a route he had to take that day, and they scheduled a couple of one of our couple's calls to jam the, that route, and multiple IEDs exploded on his route. And he said they were set up to, for him, knowing he was there. And so the great quote for me, of being a commander at that time, a couple's calls saved my life. And, uh, but that, that's some of the things that EW can do. And to me, it's a very tangible example. Well, I hate to be frustrating and go, but uh, <laughs> thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. I got to get back to the hill. So. Thank you. This is a, Thank a you very much. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Can, can we hold on to you all for another ten minutes? Yeah, I'm about, good. About that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the floor? I had a question that, that was sent in uh, via email by, by someone who wasn't able to, to attend in person. Um, and, and that was questions sort of on lessons learned from Ukraine that you think might be relevant in an Indo-Pacific fight um, against a peer adversary like China. Um, or, or is, is, I guess, the, the, the severity of the environment in Ukraine translating uh, or, or certain elements of that fight sort of resonating as you have conversations with DOD and, and encouraging folks to either take experiential lessons, you know, what they're observing in Ukraine, or say, well, we have to do better modeling and simulation so that we can actually assess how a fight would take place involving the EMS? I'll start, uh, then we'll yield yeah. back. But supply chain, obviously, big issue. We, we have howled out our abilities to just do basic production. So I think Ukraine's really put a, a light on our abilities to produce. And I would say the same. Is in EW, you know, we've gotten to just a couple of companies. And yet when you do that, that's going to rise, raise the price of, uh, per, you know, doing business there. I think when it comes to the operational side, I'm more operational than on the logistics side of it. Just I've been on the operational side my whole life. It seems to me on the bad side, neither side could get air superiority. And part of it was none of them had dominant ability to degrade radars and be able to 
take out the eyes and ears of the other side. So therefore, when they flew aircraft in the, the other person's airspace, those aircraft are getting shot down. So they either need to have you know, the more stealth side or they gotta be going after those radars. And, and, but neither side has been able to achieve air superiority and the lack of the EW abilities there is one of the reasons why. So you would say if they had better EW, they could have had more dominant over the other person's airspace. On the other side of that, with precision munitions, which can replace a lot of aircraft, they've been deadly, right? When you, when you can hit a mailbox at 100 kilometers, then you match that with ELINT and targeting capabilities, the Ukrainians have it and the Russians have it. And so where you, now you see EW being used on the positive side of identifying where our target's at in quick order, and then you got a precision munition that can hit that. So I've seen where areas where they had better EW, it could have had an impact, but where you see where it's very effective, being very deadly as well. So I see the good, good and bad going on here. I can't add a whole lot more to that other than to go back to the supply chain issues. One of the reasons why um, I was able to go with uh, then Chairman Smith to uh, Australia and to India early days on this, uh, on this battle or this war was because of a concern of how we were going to backfill a lot of the things that we were expending or, 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 or sending to Ukraine. Um, manufacturing and production of a lot of the things that we are worried about having enough of. Um, we need to be thinking more about how we're doing that with our allies or, or um, people like, frankly, India as well. Um, and so I do worry about the fact that we um, need to be more thoughtful about how we can backfill and have hot, you know, production lines or warm production lines of things, you know, for what is probably going to be. Um, at least we should be preparing for whatever could happen in Indo-PACON, and we are we should be learning lessons from that. Um, the other thing, as you mentioned, uh, I'm in intrigued by this, and I, we could get into probably an argument about this. Um, I agree with you. I think the, sur the surgical precision of a lot of the weaponry that we have has been demonstrated in Ukraine. One of the things I was anx anxious about was the use of um, uh, cluster bombs and cluster munitions because they're not surgically precise. And I understand that we're in that place where we have to we have to use whatever we have. I'm just frustrated that we didn't have enough of well, things that were more effective. I don't disagree with you on that to a degree. I, we should have sent them ATACMs. What happened, the White House decided yeah. not to send ATACMs, which has a 300-kilometer yeah. range. could hit a mailbox at that range. I'm, you know, just yeah, the hyperbole well, course, there. But, all the things so by not there. sending them what the, yeah. what the Russians did, we sent them the HIMARS. They moved their key yeah. logistic areas yeah. back enough where the HIMARS can't impact. If we sent them ATACMs, that's a game changer. But for whatever reason, the White House is reluctant. And so as, I don't know what, the, as an alternative, a weak alternative, they're going, to send the, they're going to send the cluster munitions. I really think the ATAC would be a game changer because, yeah. once again, you can use your targeting abilities, some of that being ELINT and other uh, intelligence, uh, and those, those ATAC would be, would be uh, I don't see, that's got to be the biggest game changer we could do going forward. Problem is we've done, I always feel like we do too little too late and we're, Compromising what we send them, We're and then, yeah. which is hoping Ukraine not lose. I'd like to help them win. Mm -hmm. Those are great observations. I think in particular on this topic of precision munitions, right, and how it's really changed warfare and the ability to precisely target um, locations. It's also, I think, been really interesting to observe in the war in Ukraine, how even some precise munitions, like the Storm Shadow cruise missiles, they've been doing st structured attacks. So they'll send miniature air launch decoys to help Mm -hmm. open up the path, and then the, the precision munitions will come out, because even those precision munitions are vulnerable to yeah. electronic attack or countermeasures. So um, EMS capabilities are essential across the board, basically. It's about what we were doing in Vietnam with the F-4s, decoys for the 105s, <laughs> right? Absolutely. <laughs> so that there's another question um, from the floor, please. Yeah, th thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being a part of this panel. Uh, Dave Muller, currently with AT&T. Previously, I was one of the authors of the EMS superiority strategy, and uh, ran the implementation plan effort. Have a seat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, one want to just agree with Representative Bacon's comment earlier that I, I, I agree with you that I think a large majority of the advances we've made in the last six years directly due to the action, particularly the questions that Congress keeps asking about this and uh, making sure that DOD keeps a, keeps a focus on it. Uh, I'd like to talk or ask you real quickly about, you know, the, the spectrum sharing initiatives because I think that Often it gets clouded as a domestic issue, and these 5G networks, based on 3G going every, up everywhere, they're global. Yeah, good point you made. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Tim pointed that yeah. out earlier, and you know, 
DOD is going to need to operate around these networks. Yeah. It's probably the most predictable form of interference in the congested environment of the uh, of mm -hmm. the MOE. And you know, I'd like to focus on you know DOD recognizing it needs to find the solutions for that. And you know, when we talk about domestic spectrum sharing, and I think we've got good initiatives going on here, and you know, there's there's a lot of conversation, and information sharing going on. And my my hats off to Vernita Harris and her team who put together a good process to, to, to keep industry and DOD talking about this. Here in the, in the States, we can work with DOD and help identify the waveform and figure out mitigation techniques. But you know, we need to drive towards real solutions. Those solutions eventually have to be inherent in DOD systems, which have to mitigate that interference with a non-cooperative partner, you know, an, an, over, an overseas network. And right now, the, the Spectrum Relocation Fund, which is used to, 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 to move DOD systems when, uh, to vacate the spectrum, it, it eliminates the ability to, or by statute, <coughs> it's not allowed to fund improvements in capabilities. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, if, if you representatives would, would support opening that up to improved capabilities and making an incentive to the services to actually use Spectrum Relocation Fund assets to fund those capabilities that wouldn't just enable spectrum sharing domestically, but also mitigate interference overseas. You know, as right now, it seems like, you know, it's like telling someone that has a 1995 Chevy, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll buy a car to replace your Chevy, but you can't get a single thing in that new car that doesn't, that isn't in your 95 Chevy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not very realistic. So I just ask if you comment on, you know, the need for those interference mitigation techniques overseas and perhaps the, the willingness to open up the spectrum relocation fund. Well, you said it very you. clearly, it's realistic. Yeah, we could do everything in our country to deconflict. China has already made the decision to favor 5G over S band. So other countries are doing the same. So even if we make it good in our country, we're not flying missions in our country, combat missions. Hopefully they're not. Hopefully not in our lifetime, right? But we're gonna be flying in the Far East and Europe where that where they're not worried about the S band conflict and they're gonna put in the 5G. So we so we do have to find a way for the military to work around it. And it's that's just a it's a fact of life that we gotta, we got to solve. So thank you. Well, th I think it's a, uh, we have one final quick question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I appreciate that. This is James Stewart. I'm uh, the Spectrum Warfare Systems Department Chief Scientist at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Crane, Indiana. Just a quick, uh, quick tidbit about Crane. It's the largest contingency of folks devoted to EW on the globe, 1,200 or so folks devoted to DW in all domains. Um, we support um, air, ground, surface, EW as well. Um, and with our strong expeditionary force, we are pushing towards a joint MSO um, to assess, develop, and build, distribute operational um, solutions at the tactical edge. So my question is this. Last week, I was at the University of Nebraska um, in your, your home state. Go Big Red. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, kicking off a project that deals with manipulating the truth, which is what I like to call EW, right? We're manipulating truth. Some may say the media does that as, as well. Or masking, masking exactly. the truth, you're right. Exactly, or yeah. masking the truth. <laughs> um, so the project deals with manipulating the truth with regards to adaptive um, environments. You can't go into much beyond that. But it's for ensuring that our warfighters can have an informed offensive um, set of um, actions to execute, right? So it, it's a different paradigm shift from tra traditional EW, right? Traditional EW is all about enabling kinetic fire. Um, this new paradigm shift is about how can we leverage the spectrum, the EMS, um, for offensive means and deceptive means? Mm -hmm. So my question is, what policies do you feel we need to put in place to ensure that we can get the advocacy for this yeah. new um, necessary uh, shift in how EW is, is managed, right? Uh, EW leaders understand that this is where um, electromagnetic warfare needs to go. Uh, the warfighters understand. You so. raise a uh, very good truth. We look, sometimes we look at EW and that stovepipe, but really it's, it's part of the IO. 
and I don't know if I have my terms right anymore. I've been retired since 2014. But you know, the I.O. world has, you know, PSYOPs, deception, EW, and I'm forgetting some. And I've done a lot of all of that in my 30 years in the Air Force. I mean, I was in the, I was doing I.O. in Iraq. I'm published on deception. Uh, and, but it's all part of the I.O. portfolio. So what you're really saying is this, this project, University of Nebraska, is looking at this as more in the I.O. run. It's, a, it's one of the tools in the I.O. We just have to walk back and just remember, you know, you have air domain, sea domain, land domain, space domain, cyber, you know. EW is all about degrading all those domains and, and, creating, and creating havoc and they're communicating with each other. If we can degrade communications or radars for air and space, I mean, we, our job is to undermine all those, to be operating in all those domains and giving us, helping to get superiority in each of those domains. And it could be putting trons on a target. We, we, could, it, we could use cyber to, for an EW output or EW for a cyber output, right? So we have to be very broad and imaginative how we use EW. And, but it is part of the art of I.O. Could I turn the question back on you and say, are, is there an answer to the question, what are the policies that we should be thinking about in Congress? You know, he's got it behind you. Okay. Yeah, I think we touched on it a little bit when we talked about um, the, necessary, the need for um, modeling and simulation, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about ensuring that our warfighters have confidence. And um, how do you gain that confidence? It's about making sure that we can test out and look at the effectiveness you know, um, through live virtual constructive, right? So I feel like putting policies in place and legislation that supports you know, advanced labs, advanced modeling simulation labs that look at live and virtual um, simulation environments, I think is, is, yeah. is important. Thanks, that's helpful. It's definitely one of the things I'm taking away from this conversation is the modeling and simulation, mm -hmm. uh, the essence of that and the importance of that. Cool. Thank you, James, for that excellent question. And thank you, thank um, you. representatives, thank you. for joining us today. Your leadership, sort of in passion for this, really is the reason why DOD is now starting to move forward on treating the EMS as a critical warfighting area and, and starting to address, I think, some of the glaring gaps that we have today to, to seek advantage in the future. Grateful to all of you for joining us for this conversation. And as I think Congress continues its work, there's going to be new opportunities to, one, I think, figure out what you pass with the Senate. <laughs> Uh, and then two, chart out the future. So any final words? Yeah, I want to thank Chrissy. Uh, this is our third panel in so many weeks. <laughs> she's either get, she's going to get real tired of me fast. Uh, we and now, we're, now we got, we're, we're going to do a quality of life. We're, get, we're, we're in charge of the quality of life panel, trying to help out our junior enlisted primarily who uh, are having to get on SNAP. We got housing issues. We got daycare issues. We got medical. And so we have about nine months to come up with proposals for the HASC for the next NDA to improve quality of life. So we're, we're back together in two hours. Yeah, and I, I also <laughs> want to echo that appreciation for you. Um, we were just talking yesterday. We've been on so many things together, whether supply chain or STEM and STEAM, and now on now this, and I'm learning a great deal. So thank you for, well, for being mutual. my partner in crime on this, uh, and I'll see you in another couple hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Reload. <laughs> and thanks to Brian and the AOC for joining us as a partner in this, and to all of you for coming once more. Have a good day. Thanks.